I had this conversation recently. Like, if you look at the the collapse of these big exchanges, these crypto exchanges, and the collapse of the value of some of these coins, you think like this looks like with hindsight, this looks so. It looks like just have taken out of Kendall Burger's book. <laughs> it's such a predictable yeah, yeah. Um, event, and you know. But if you'd argued that two years ago, when non fungible tokens and whatever were the latest uh, uh, hottest thing in town, uh, people would have had you know all these arguments why why this is not a tulip mania, why this is different, and um, with hindsight, it just looks like you know a good old uh, a good old uh, financial bubble. This is Rob Johnson president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Moritz Schuler, who's been a grantee at INET, a senior fellow. He's a professor both at University of Bonn and Science Po in France. And he has guided a very, very interesting project, which is now in the aftermath of a very exciting conference among a new generation of young financial and financial macroeconomists. It's brought together in a University of Chicago press book that we released in November called Leveraged. Lawrence, thanks for uh, joining me here today. Thanks for having me, Rob. And so at the outset, I, uh, I guess I'm curious, going back to the pre-conference, as you and Richard Vague, who's on the INET board and has written brief history of doom and about debt jubilees and everything else. What were you envisioning? What was the problem that you wanted to address that inspired this in, entire line of work resulting in this book? Well, we, we thought that since the 2008-2009 global financial crisis, there had been a new generation of macro financial economists who thought differently about the sources of endemic financial instability in, in our in our economies in our society and we wanted to give voice to that new generation bring them together in a conference that uh, i and organized and um, uh, it coincided with roughly the 10th uh, anniversary of the of the global financial crisis and we wanted to take stock and the problem that we said at the outset and, and, and our participants and uh, speakers and contributors were sort of uh, given is like how do we how do we explain that this drive towards financial liberalization deeper and more integrated financial markets that had started in the 1970s 1980s how do how do we explain that you know, and it's all undeniably finance is much bigger, markets are more integrated, markets are in a way more complete than they've ever been before. How do we explain that this idea and this process of financial integration had produced the opposite of what its cheerleaders in the in this liberalization drive envisaged, namely more stability, more completeness of markets, more opportunity, and ultimately more growth. And uh, the starting point for this conference was that it seems that market deepening in the area of finance has not produced what Arrow de Bro would call sort of more complete markets uh, that are self-stabilizing, but an endemic financial stability problem. So at the, at the level of what you might call seeing what might be called false projections of optimism in light of experience, do you then explore, in essence, the nature of the public policy regulating finance, or are you exploring things like the spillovers between the financial sector and other sectors, or kind of all of the above? What, what are the, what are the uh, deep dives that you find in this book? that which you might call unmask some of the false consciousness of that orthodox era and also what kind of things to do to understand it right. better and to manage it better in the future that's an excellent question rob so 
I think well, we started out with the idea of, of a diagnosis. And the diagnosis was financial liberalization, the deepening and expansion of financial markets has not made the world a safer place. It has not led to more stability and it has not led necessarily led to more growth. Instead, a lot of what that financial sector that we have right now does is quite far away from what you know we traditionally would call uh, sort of the, the savings investment intermediation that is at the heart of finance. So that was the diagnosis. And then we said when we invited um, a number of really excellent, outstanding scholars and gave them questions, um, gave them relatively precise, curated questions that we asked them to address and, and reply. Um, give you a question, uh, an example would be, um, are the, do the benefits of, or do the risk and costs of credit booms outweigh the costs? Um, do, does the price of, is the price of risk in periods leading up to financial crisis is it mispriced? Is there do we do we do we understand why why these over optimistic um, periods have another question we gave? Is it do do these periods of excessive risk taking that ended in financial crisis happen because people have wrong incentives or people have wrong beliefs? So we curated a set of quite um, you know questions that we thought were central to understanding that phenomenon of with its instability that is with us as a feature of this uh, financial system that we've created, and ask our, our contributors, ask our authors to address them very, in a very uh, concentrated way. One starting point for this project is, is one that has like proven true repeatedly also in recent, like in, in, the, in the past two or three years in the pandemic and and, and, and after, namely, the feeling that whenever something bad hits our economies, and unfortunately, we have had quite a few bad hits recently, um, the financial system only s survives that with an awful lot of government support. Government support, I mean, also central bank liquidity support. So remember when COVID struck, um, central banks reacted very quickly and, and, and flooded uh, markets with liquidity, created facilities for corporate debt markets, for high yield junk bond markets. Um, all of a sudden, we discovered that um, we had to uh, protect hedge funds, private equity funds and, and other very risky players in the market because they had become systemically relevant. So. The question how we ended up in a world where essentially um, we've built this very large and enormously big financial sector that seems to be, you know, only able to survive with uh, a government central bank backstop that's very, um, you know, the invisible hand doesn't do it. It needs a really visible hand of, of central banks to keep that market together. So something seems to be um, very fragile, endemically fragile, and that's a central theme that we talk about in the book. Yeah, and I, I gather uh, from my reading through the chapters that there is a great deal of concern at one level, just within the market dynamics about what you might call side effects and unintended consequences. There is some concern that if you create which you might call an amplifying feedback boom, it only leads to a bust and slower long-term growth. But on the other side, I, I sensed the dilemma that sometimes if you don't allow, which you call enthusiasm and vitality to bootstrap and jumpstart technological innovation, you're almost confining the economy to be in a less, which you might call dynamic and evolving way. And so I, I sense these dilemmas going back and forth in the different chapters. But I also sensed, and, and you've said it very nicely implicitly in your, in your last comment here, it's not so much about the interactions between different things in the private sector. It's about that creature, which I might call the mother of all moral hazards. If you see these things 
these, as you said, hedge funds, big financial institutions, etc., as being too big to fail. And then they understand that they will be bailed out without any kind of system of prior restraint. We are what you might call fomenting excess. And then the taxpayer who supports the bailout with the funding is subsidizing aggressive risk taking in the financial sector. And that did obviously after the Dodd-Frank and TARP legislation and so forth appear to demoralize a lot of people because as Joe Stiglitz said, the polluters got bailed out and the polluters got paid and the rest of us, how do you say, bore the burden of the downturn. So I see, I see what I really like about this book is that a lot of these dilemmas are consciously addressed. There's no kind of hiding from powerful sectors in the economy that, that this young group of people seeing how profound that crisis was in terms of not only economic activity, but the credibility of expertise and the belief in governance, this becomes a very, very important environment to explore vigorously. But uh, there, there is also a thread running through that book, and I think that connects very nicely to what you just said, which is, it's not, oh, there is there's one side when thinking about financial stability that has to do with the incentives of financial agents and financial actors. And as you mentioned, the repeated policy of, you know, going back to budget and even longer that central banks are the lender of last resort to financial institutions in trouble. Um, that is something that we probably all just as deposit insurance, we, we, we subscribe to these safety nets. We think they're tested and proven and we need those. But we've also ended up in a, in a world where it seems like central banks assuming that role, have to run ever faster just to stand still in the sense that there is this interaction that you talked about between what the financial sector does, how it thinks about how it prices risk and how it anticipates a risk and how central banks then when things go wrong, um, if you will, uh, come in as the reinsurer of last resort for finance in the name of protecting uh, the economy and protecting society from the uh, fallout of that. And I think central banks, you know, they have a very good argument. They say, like, why would I hold the economy hostage for the speculations or the, the deeds of some people on Wall Street? On the other hand, with that, you know, very justified sort of protective instinct of central banks, uh, you will uh, not go, get into a situation where these players on Wall Street ever take the responsibility for what they're doing. It's in a way, it's only when they fail and when they're in trouble that you actually have the power to regulate them because the moment you've stabilized everything, they, uh, they're quite healthy again and they influence the political process uh, in their interests. So that again, the political economy of, of finance um, where it looks like the players that often caused, like, caused the crisis or did the most uh, risky things beforehand, get rewarded by getting even bigger after the fact. Um, that uh, is another very fundamental question about the financial sector and our modern economy that we haven't solved. And pointing to these, I mean, the first one I mentioned was, uh, how is it possible that more complete markets that we, you know, Growing up as economists, you think that more complete markets are great. That means people can insure more. There's more. There's more choice. There's all kinds of uh, mechanisms that make sure that if 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 you know there's 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 a larger and deeper um, choice of options to choose from, then things should be more stable and better. How did that fail so spectacularly in the case of finance, mm -hmm. where more complete markets have, have seemingly brought us more instability and not more? Um, and not more stabil stability. And the other question is, how do we ever leave these cycles of, these political economy cycles of um, risk-taking, bailouts, and, and lobby power that prevents um, 
you know, fundamental change in, in financial regulation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought one of the more uh, innovative chapters was created by Rudiger uh, Wallenbrock, where because of what you might call the ex post demonization of mm -hmm. financial executives, mm -hmm. I never met a financial executive that was at the top of one of these institutions at the time of the great financial crisis that was happy about it. And mm -hmm. so understanding they, how would I say, were in charge is different than saying they could feel deeply heads I win, tails you lose. Mm -hmm. And while that may seep in, Fallenbrock really went through the compensation structures and the incentive schemes and so forth and essentially said what it looks like is that a lot of these people had a lot of skin in the game and lost a lot of money personally. So yeah. perhaps the, uh, the question, and once again, is more about how the taxpayer pays for what you might call it, securing the creditors, keeping the cost of funding down and all kinds of things. So when the crisis occurs, the executives are not, uh, how would I say, on the sideline having protected themselves while the ship goes down. They are seemingly from this paper, people who didn't see it coming, perhaps were caught up in the enthusiasm of the boom and didn't see the turning point and themselves also paid a price, which is, I, th I think, an interesting contribution to the debate, to the yin and yang and good and evil that you're exploring here. I'm very glad you bring this up, Rob, because I wanted to also give an example of where this new cohort of um, economists that we brought together for this project is, I think, in a, in a, in a very good way, um, undogmatic, um, willing to entertain new hypotheses, willing to step outside of the orthodoxy, even if that is something that, you know, we might all consider something that's a truism, the truism being that, oh, these uh, CEOs on Wall Street, they, you know, they didn't have enough skin in the game and things would have gone otherwise if, I don't know, Dick Fold and Lehman Brothers had, um, had, had more skin in the game. And what Rudiger Farnbrook does in this chapter is, is to expose very nicely that many of these people had a lot of skin in the game. Yeah. So, um, and lost a lot of their own money, which doesn't mean they, you know, didn't potentially still, you know, did things that, that were irresponsible. Um, um, presumably, some of them really did, but it tells us that we need to look deeper than like the easy explanations for why financial crises happen. And in this case, if you sort of boil it down to the question, do crises happen because people have bad incentives or people have bad beliefs? Um, Rudiger Farnborough makes the point that likely, and also Samuel Hansen in his wonderful discussion that's in, in, in the book, um, makes the point that it's probably a combination of both. There is like just assuming that all these CEOs on Wall Street knew it was a big housing bubble and everything would go to hell in a handbasket also doesn't do justice to the complexity of, of, of crisis. And we, we've learned in the past, you know, if you will, past 15, 20 years, the most, almost the most interesting research that has come out of, of financial economics has been behavioral finance. And we've learned so much now about the deviations from rational expectations the, the, the hurting, the biases that can lead to mispricing and risk taking. And, and it's set up almost, and it's almost, I would almost say this is a, this would be a great book for a graduate course in financial instability to use as a, uh, to use as a textbook because you go through these uh, individual chapters week by week and you address really each week one of the fundamentally, fundamentally important and much debated issues. Is it, you know, what's the role of incentives versus the role of, beliefs or bad expectations, what's the role of, um, of, of, for example, skin in the game and preventing risk-taking. There's a chapter on that making the point that 
you know, we had very high capital ratios uh, in the 1920s and it didn't prevent uh, the depression and it didn't prevent all the risk taking that took place um, because, you know, the, the, the potential for, for, um, so for, for disciplining risk taking at the banks through skin in the game might also be, actually be quite limited and, and there is no way around the tighter regulation um, also on the sort of looking closely at what banks do on the asset side and not just regulating the liability side. But um, how would I say, when I look at the, the good and evil, this paper that is about the bankers suffering is distinct mm -hmm. from the question of what banks and their lobbyists do to create right. a, what you call a system that's perhaps unduly supportive of their desires. So the question of who gets appointed right. to the Fed, regulators, how right. often do you have examination, super, how tight is the supervision? These are things that right. in a world that depends on money and politics, that can very clearly be influenced by deep pocketed lobbyists. So there isn't what you might call a declaration of innocence vis-a-vis the structural form of finance, but that one dimension, which is somehow these people are cynical and mm -hmm. have abandoned ship and preserved themselves while we all suffer, is it's in itself wrong. And what, like you're mm -hmm. saying, when you when you think about like the Inet Young scholars or whatever, making a course out of this book, you can see how you, you might say, you, as a team, you did not blink at exploring any of these avenues, but you didn't because of the wave of emotion, which was particularly early on, anti-finance. Mm -hmm. You didn't neglect exploring whether certain aspects of the accusation are without basis. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can see in the themes of the book, these questions of what creates a vital medium term economy. I can see concerns about the incentives of executives, some concerns about political economy. And it would be interesting, I think, to hear from the collection of writers in which Mahal a follow up. What if if you said the next course was how do we design what to have in light of what we learned? Mm -hmm. I think it would be fascinating because mm -hmm. many of the authors were quite refreshing in saying, mm -hmm. "I don't really know what to do here." Particularly the mm -hmm. early, the first section of the book, which was talking about the trade-offs between what you might call restraining credit allocation and the capacity for innovation and dynamism versus what you might call not getting reckless and having booms and busts. Is a boom bust mm -hmm. economy in the medium term actually more dynamic than one that is tightly constrained and never really develops the momentum that may spur great innovation? I think that dilemma is fascinating. Exactly. And that's a, that's a fascinating chapter that Emil Werner, who is yep. an assistant yes. professor at MIT, wrote and then um, there is an, an equally, like, I think, intellectually forceful um, discussion of that paper by Holger Miller at, from NYU, who makes yes, exactly that point. Right. Well, how do we know? How do we know that a financial system that avoids these boom and bust cycles is ultimately more um, ultimately in the interest of society or the economy? Um, we might think it is, and I, I think I would, uh, you know, we, we all have our priors here, what, what would be a, a financial stability, also if you think about the political consequences that it has, is, is, is extremely desirable, but as you say, it's far from clear that uh, restraining, making sure that no booms and no, no busts ever happen is, is in our long-term interest and increases right. welfare of citizens because you and you, you cut down on some dynamism. And um, that's an old question, I think, that the book addresses, just as 
if I can highlight this, another very, I think, fascinating chapter by Ativ Mian from Princeton, mm -hmm. who looks at the link between inequality and financial instability and, the, and what finance does. And the argument there is that, you know, you can't, in, in a way, you can't separate the two because um, if you have changes in the distribution of income, um, all of these financial flows and income flows are ultimately handled by the financial system. So that translates into savings behavior, you know, more rich people at the top of the income distribution get more income, a bigger share of the pie, if you will, then um, more savings will pile up at the top because savings propensities are higher. Mm -hmm. That means that there's a lot of savings in the economy that are looking for a home and financial engineers come and find instruments to, um, you know, place these savings and turn them into turn them into investments, into borrowing of other people and companies. So in there, I would say like we, we learned something very deeply about um, the interconnectedness of, of, of societal trends such as inequality and the risk that poses for financial stability. And it, it all brings us back to this point that I think is, for me, a very fascinating intellectual starting point is we started 30, 40 years ago in sort of unfettering finance and in letting it, letting it go and grow in the, today we'd say in the naive assumption that this would make it for a more stable, more complete, better functioning, pro-growth uh, financial system. And we now stand in front of this, you know, if you look at the, quantitative indicators that, as you mentioned, Alan Taylor, Oscar Jordan, and I have also sort of developed in the long run as part of our INET grants and INET projects. We look at these charts and they all look like sort of hockey sticks where something in the last 40 years, all these financial uh, indicators, credit volumes, um, leverage, house prices, whatever you look at have, have really um, have, have accelerated and have, have exploded in, in some cases. And we realized today in, 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 in 2022 that we have very, very bad idea about sort of how this world actually, like what are the deep parameters of this financial sector? As you say, what's the role of incentives? What's the role of expectations of beliefs? What's the role of regulators in pushing these booms? What's the role of CEOs? So it feels like we've created this enormous, enormous financial sector. We What we know is that our premises, our priors that we had 30, 40 years ago were wrong, but there's a big void in saying like, so what is it actually? What, how do we think about this leveraged world that we've created? Um, maybe it was good, maybe better than a counterfactual, but to be honest, we don't know. And I think that's the strength of the book to yeah. really clearly point to these dilemma um, that are out there. And I do think there are some, uh, which you might call very long-term echoes that, if you will, re-enter the stage. And what I'm thinking about is Keynes treatise on probability and ontological uncertainty, mm -hmm. Frank Knight, Kindleberger, Minsky, others saying this, what I'll call engineering-like, and I was trained as an engineer as an undergraduate, engineering-like mechanical financial economics is not the right vision when there are unknown and unknowable unknowns in the future. We're not doing backward induction. This isn't just what you might call smart guys with software and arbitrage who adhere to an equilibrium and maximize everything. That fundamental radical uncertainty, which George Soros wrote about in Alchemy of Finance, is the context in which all of this is embedded. And acknowledging mm -hmm. which you might call that humility that even in, like for instance i'm speaking on the horizon now when you look at climate change mm -hmm. the statistical distributions you'd have whether asset prices or actuarial tables or really don't mean very much when a profound new structural challenge emerges you just don't have stability of the distributions that you can count on and work in that kind of algorithmic or mathematical way. And I see lots of people in the 
ESG world and in the insurance business and so forth, quite daunted now by the challenge of not knowing what the structure, which implies survival of the human race, will have to look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not like we know and we're corrupt. It's really that we, there may be resistance that might be called damaging to the future of humankind. People vested interests, I'm not denying that. But there is a daunting uncertainty. And a financial system that doesn't acknowledge that as the context, I think, is a misspecification. Um, I think that's an excellent point. And I think the point that we make in the book that's related is the idea that people typically, households and businesses typically take on debt and leverage up in situations where they think the future is a place they kind of can envisage in a way you have some stable parameter about how the world works. That's the situation where people are feel comfortable to go deep into debt. It doesn't necessarily mean that they expect that the future will be, you know, puppies and rainbows, but situations in which they think there's little downside are situations when people, and this is this is all this is all the Minsky and Kimbleberg in a way, when when you, when things are stable, this is when people become willing to take bets on that stability and by taking these bets on future stability they actually sort of dig their own hole because the increasing leverage means that um, any shock in the future will have much more much bigger consequences than what they thought it would have and they also miss that everyone else is kind of doing the same so and i think your climate change example speaks to that the idea that Coming back to what I said earlier, that we live in this now leveraged world, hence leverage the title of the book. So we've kind of woken up to the fact we live in this highly leveraged world. Um, and, you know, and the future doesn't look quite as safe anymore as it as it maybe looked in the 1990s when there was the end of history. Now now's the end of the end of history. <laughs> the world is not that safe, not such a safe place anymore. Yeah. And um, but we still settled with these large amounts of, of debt. And then, you know, I can understand why probably if we were running the Fed, Rob, you and me would do the same. We would probably, like, whenever there is a shock, we would do whatever we can, whatever it takes, as Mario Draghi said, yeah. to uh, stabilize the situation. But people, and that this is, you know, this is the, the irony and, and the, the forward-looking nature of things. People understand that we will always do that and they will take this into account and take, take on even bigger risks. So we are, we are in, a, in, a really, in a really difficult position and, and is especially, which I subscribe to, we are in this world where we actually, we can't put probability on the future of history. So we might end up in, in a situation where a lot of this debt that was taken out in the expectation of stability of income, stability of interest rates. I think that's a big question right now. You know, how far can the Fed even go with interest rates before reaching some financial stability upper bound, if you will? Um, um, you know, these are these are certainly there are a lot of people who've made plans in the last ten years, uh, not assuming that mortgage rates would go up to seven percent again. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always remembered when I was an undergraduate and flirting with the idea of becoming an economist, I took a course with Charles Kindleberger, where he was working on his book, Manias, Panics, and Crashes. And one day, right. one of the students, very dynamic young guy, uh, later worked with long-term capital, he said to Kindleberger, when are things most dangerous? Is he said, and Kinderberger said, when people get optimistic and they think past his prologue is when they're putting their neck in a noose. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, right. it's that exactly. notion that yeah. you don't know, but you get, how would I say, calmed and less on guard. And then you start exactly. with the optimism, extending yourself, putting yourself at risk for when things deteriorate. And uh, Exactly. The other, the other thing that I remember, not from Charlie, but from others, like William Grider, who wrote a famous book, uh, Secrets of the Temple on the Federal Reserve, was people talk about the importance of the independence of central banks. In your book, 
There are a number of passages which talk about, which you might call electoral cycle, boom busts where extending credit to help people, incumbents get reelected and what have you. But the idea, once we got to these large scale bailouts like the great financial crisis was when they said the Fed has to be independent, it was like they had to be independent from the electoral cycle manipulation. But now the question is, who do they have to be independent from? And when they'll do mm -hmm. the bailouts, I never blame a central banker. Once we're going over the cliff, if you've got a choice between crashing over the cliff or having a safety net and getting everybody back from falling off the side, you go for the safety because the, the unnecessary losses are enormous. But the question is ex ante. Can you create a system that's resilient enough that you don't have to exercise that bailout emergency very often? And that's where the lobbying and other things come back in. I'm curious, uh, there's uh, a number of people that have worked with INET, Michael Greenberger in particular, who at this juncture is quite concerned about the number or scale, I should say, of derivatives that are not reported so that there can be, which you might call, whether it's offshore or whatever, it's involved, it's woven into the bank holding companies and investment mm -hmm. bank holding companies in ways where we don't know how risky things are at the institutions that we have to protect for systemic stability. And some, some people who have suggested to me, Greenberger did a lot of this research after he left the CFTC for INET. Some have suggested to me that this relates to the competition around the world between financial centers, less disclosure, less uh, scrutiny, means that the financial firms will migrate to the equivalent of exchanges in the locations, whether it be London or Frankfurt or Shanghai or Hong Kong or what have you, they'll go to the places where the regulatory requirements are minimal. And then we get into a competition among financial centers to attract market share by making the system actually more dangerous vis-a-vis -vis bailouts and taxpayers. I mean, I, th I think there was a, there's a strong element of this in, in what we've seen in the crypto space in recent years. Yes. Um, and um, I mean, speaking of it, um, and it's um, it's not what we there is a, there is a chapter in the book um, that Juliana Begenau wrote. She's an assistant professor at Stanford, and Nina Boryachenko from the New York Fed um, also has a wonderful yep. discussion of this, where she exactly talks about the question of how do we actually understand the risk exposure of banks and how can we how can we think about this in a way that does justice to the complexity of the balance sheets to the um, the arbitrage opportunities that are exploited um, across you know across jurisdictions across platforms how do you integrate that um, and she has interesting very interesting ideas in in how you can essentially use techniques from Valuing financial instruments, and you apply those to apply those to uh, to banking portfolios as well. But it and, it and I think it prepares us, and that's the interesting the interesting uh, backdoor there. Um, and uh, I see that as a policy discussion coming up in various places um, to think about banking regulation and financial regulation, not just as regulating their liability blank the liabilities of the banking system yeah. which as you know is about deposits and how liquid can they be and do we need to insure them is there deposit insurance it's about capital how much capital it should be but to also look as you say on the asset side on the derivative exposure we need to really better understand um what banks do uh with their on their asset side and maybe uh, get up to speed there with regulation um, as well in, in, in ways that we haven't been uh, particularly successful in the past. Which, it, it, in a kind of meta sense, you know, we, we deploy in the private sector people to go into energy. And they have solar or they have wind or they have fossil fuels or whatever. And what we call externalities 
of carbon burning, upper atmosphere deterioration becomes, which you might call the public good, meaning embedded mm. in all these activities are side effects. Some can be positive, some can reduce carbon. But in the financial sector, we've treated these entities like they are private entities and in a market-based society, more freedom, more discretion to use their expertise where they do. But these systems, the credibility of the systems, the fear of collapse, the need to invoke the public tre treasury are all testament that there is an element of systemic design and maintenance that is about the public good. It's not just a private entity. And the scale and the power, the penetrating power of finance has turned it into what I'll call a public system that whose integrity affects us all, even if we don't play day to day inside of the financial sector. Mm -hmm. I think it's an amazingly uh, powerful dilemma over for we might call architects of future social design. And, uh, and how we, like when you mentioned crypto, I watched a mm -hmm. number of videos at a conference in Miami a few months ago. And people were acting as though freedom of crypto, even on very large scale, was about personal freedom, as though there were no mm -hmm. systemic side effects from which you might call massive default propagation that would affect mm. the banking system and other things. I, I found it mm. fascinating how, it, which you might say with the history of currencies, medium of exchange, unit of account, store of value, too big to fail, all of these other things, how these people could even be having that discussion without considering mm. the systemic side effects. Right, and I think, I mean, leverage as a book title um, implies already, I mean, what you're talking about are the, the big, the, the, the externalities that my debt, your debt, our debt imposes on everyone. Yes. And somehow that leverage isn't, that's the externality, the, the risks that we, um, that we individually um, take that ultimately, um, both the banks or the other side, the, the, the borrowers that ultimately, um, are too big for us to, um, they're not priced correctly, I guess. That's, that's, the, that's the, um, the easy way to think about it. So having this enormous amount of debt out there and all this leverage that's been created over the last 30 years is a massive, um, has created massive externalities um, for, for the economy. And we will, so, I mean, it's a different way of saying, of telling the same story, um, thinking about what I do my decision to buy a house with a loan to value ratio of 90 10 um, affects um, the stability of the system as a whole and um, i might not see the externalities that i create when things go badly but um, they're clearly there and and, and these these um, um, collective decisions um, might, might might have brought us to a place and i guess that's in between the lines of the book, that is a the that is the thesis there. That uh, had we known how finance operates and what the sort of deeper parameters and the instabilities, the behavioral issues, the regulatory issues, the incentive issues are, we wouldn't have grown a financial sector as big as we have it now. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I found uh, fascinating just about this whole endeavor, and I'm, I'm taking it back even before this conference is codified in Richard Vague's book on the brief history of doom, because he shows that, let, let, let me just contrast it. The chapter on the bankers with their incentives also taking a hit mm -hmm. it is fascinating with, in contrast to Richard's work, which says you can see these things coming. Central mm -hmm. banks can look at certain ratios and debt and maybe first and second derivatives and so forth and identify ex ante the, what you might call it, zones in which things become dangerous. Mm 
his brief history of Dune is about mm-hmm. 40 some financial crises that have common measures that can be seen ahead of time. So it's, it's a bit fascinating that he can find that. And perhaps central banks or particularly people with so much at stake, like CEOs of big banks and investment banks, haven't assimilated that framework to protect themselves or, or to manage their portfolio or to manage their society. And uh, Richard, who was on the INET board and was the primary supporter of the project that led to this conference in his book, I think it's I think his work, perhaps in the next chapter, might be fascinating to integrate in if how would I say, if this you I'm a doctor's son, so when I heard you early on talking about diagnosis, I say, okay, when the diagnosis is as interesting as this, now what are the remedies? And it might be interesting to have a follow-on event with the diagnosis and what do we diagnose that's not there that should be there, like Richard's insights, and then what kind of remedies and preventive medicine can we envision? Absolutely. I think the um, the historical evidence um, that Richard in his book um, and, and the academic studies that, that have shown is that Richard uses in his book to show that crises are not like swan events. There is some, there's some indicators, there's some things we can look at in a regular way, in a systematic way, that show us that the risk of a financial instability event is rising. Uh, credit growth comes to mind, the combination of credit growth and asset price growth clearly accentuate. The single best indicator is probably just the amount of credit and its change in relationship to GDP. So there's much more credit created than the real economy um, grows or produces in, in, in additional goods and services. Something is, some people are taking bets on a future that might not come true. Um, and the fascinating thought then is, so why, if that is true, Um, To what extent can central banks act on this information? Um, I think they've taken this lesson on board with things such as macroprudential policies where they say like, okay, credit is growing very fast. We can increase loan to value, decrease loan to value ratios or or modify debt to income requirements, etc. But it also raises the question, if this is to some extent predictable, why does it still happen? And then we're back to then we're back to square one where we're saying like, okay, if there, there must be or likely there is either an incentive that brings people or bankers and maybe even households because, you know, it always takes two to tango. So someone also has to borrow um, to um, ignore the risks and do it maybe knowing that this is kind of a risky, a little bit too risky actually, but I'll do it anyways because guess what, if things go wrong, um, you know, there's going to be, interest rates are going to fall, the central banks are going to do something about it. Or, um, I guess also what we've seen a little bit in crypto, I mean, um, people tell themselves stories about this time is different and um, why the logic of boom and bust and previous evidence on credit growth is dan- can be dangerous, can lead to crisis, why doesn't it apply in this case and I had this conversation recently like if you look at the the collapse of these big exchanges these crypto exchanges and the collapse of the value of some of these coins you think like this looks like with hindsight just looks so it looks like just have taken out of Kendallberger's book <laughs> it's such a predictable yeah, yeah. Um, event and you know but if you'd argued that two years ago when um, you know or a year ago when non-fungible tokens and whatever were the latest um, the latest, um, uh, hottest thing in town, uh, people would have had, you know, all these arguments why why this is not a tulip mania, why this is different. And um, with hindsight, it just looks like, you know, a good old, uh, a good old uh, financial bubble. So what, what I, like I've, I've said a couple of times, there's a, 
humility and a dynamism and a curiosity and an energy that are embodied in this book that I find very, very magnetic. When you talk with your colleagues and when you talk with your the other authors, in the aftermath of that conference, what do you all see as next steps? What's the, what's the next thing you'd like to explore? So uh, that that's um, a very interesting. So one question that followed directly is one that we have already implemented, and you were you were there at the beginning of the year when we had a conference on debt restructuring mm -hmm. and on debt forgiveness and on ways to deal with. Um, on, on, on to strategies to deal with excessively high leverage in, in our economies. Um, some of these, you know, with the, with the student debt uh, relief, some of the ideas and discussions from that conference were one way or the other reflected or became reflected in, in policy and spoke to that uh, recent debate. Um, I think another big open question where... Um, a lot of us are, are thinking uh, right, thinking about right now is, is what Atif Mian describes as this link between inequality and and savings gluts in a way that mm. um, um, you know some it, it, where what are the distribution what's the distributional them who are the debtors and who are the creditors yes the ultimate debtors and the ultimate creditors and. Um, so in the end, it's all about households and it's some, it's households lending to other households and sort of trying to map, um, if you think about what would happen if we think about debt forgiveness, how does this tie into questions, not only of financial stability, but also wealth inequality and of broader political stability. Um, we need to understand how sort of these financial entanglements within societies actually look like. And that's a big gap in our understanding. We haven't, I mean, there's great people who started looking at this, Gabriel Zuckman and Emmanuel Saez, Tuma Piketty and others, Atif Me and Amir Sufi. There's work on this question, but ultimately we don't understand very well. Um, you know, think of the bank as a little bit as an, inter, just as an intermediary. And on the other side of that bank, there are, People, households having deposits in this bank that you know have the that provide the the funds that bank lend out. So you have these financial relations within societies that we actually need to understand if we want to think about um, if you want to under, uh, think about the effects of policies. So that's one, and I think the other, probably even more sort of directly policy related questions is what does this mean for the business of central banking? How do we I think we're right now, it, certainly in Europe, but also to some extent in the US, uh, realizing that that 10 year period of ultra low interest rates has led to some steps taken by central banks, thinking about the balance sheet expansion, the large quantitative easing programs that all of a sudden look much more complicated to unwind and much more, much, much, it was easier to do it than to imagine a world where short term interest rates would go up to 5% and you created all these uh, new reserves in the banks. Now you have to pay them 5% interest on them. And uh, what does that mean for the stability or the financial situation of central banks? But also, what does it mean more broadly for um, fiscal monetary interactions? Um, so I think. Financial stability policy through the back door has brought us back to very big questions about thinking about the coordination of monetary and fiscal policy. It might well be, I mean, I'm not, it's not my prediction, but it, we, we could end up saying like we've, we've saved the financial system, but in the process, central bank independence got so compromised that um, the... Um, we, we will reconsider whether, how would the relations between the fiscal, the, the tax payer, the fiscal authority and central banks are simply because um, the, um, the amounts of, um, of fiscal support needed or have, have become so big and, and central banks and fiscal authorities are now so intertwined that it becomes really difficult, for example, to raise interest rates beyond a certain level without endangering the economy, fiscal stability or financial stability. So there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of potential for a, for a third follow-up conference, maybe with a focus on, so how do we, 
how do we think about policy, central bank interaction going forward? Um, what role does central bank, does monetary policy play in creating, um, you know, how does low interest rates and risk taking, how are they linked? We have some ideas, but um, we have structurally, we've, we've, we've um, kept these two parts of central, what central banks do, monetary policy on the one hand and financial stability are quite separate. And um, if you bring in the third, which is monetary finance, fiscal interactions, um, you know, I mean, I had this discussion with Adam Tews a while ago, and, and we kind of both agreed in the end that the business of central banking in 10 years will look very different from what it is now. Um, anyone guess how it's going to look like, but a lot of the preconditions on what, what we came to think of as normal in the past t two decades, including the self-regulating role of finance, by the way, um, are just not true and, and we're, waking, we're waking up to the new reality now.